you know, one of the biggest themes in DeFi is like staking to farm like tokens and stuff. So uh, their idea is like maybe you can stake art um, and farm tokens or the other way around, like stake Ethereum and then you can farm fractional art um, in return or something. So I'm super excited to see that sort of come into more fruition um, within like crossing over between like DeFi and NFTs. Matt, what's happening, man? How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Sam? Oh, I'm very, very good. Very pleased today to have our guest, People Pleaser. That's way too corny, but we're just going to keep rolling. Uh, you want to tell us a little more about People Pleaser? <laughs> yeah, People Pleaser is an artist who first rose to prominence in the DeFi space and crypto Twitter with her animations around a number of the popular protocols. Um, she became, she kind of entered the NFT space with this uh, Uniswap auction that led to the spontaneous creation of Pleaser DAO, uh, which has become one of the major players uh, in the NFT DAO space. Uh, they, you know, have made high profile purchases like Edward Snowden's first NFT, uh, Tor Pro projects nft and the original doge meme it's quite the meme um yeah i think it's incredible to hear her perspective on um the evolution of the nft market i mean how she even kind of entered the world having been very deep in crypto twitter and at DeFi summer and really um kind of bringing all these different worlds together. I also love, I mean, obviously with Pleaser DAO, I mean, she has a lot of experience and understanding of DAOs, um, decentralized autonomous organizations. I think those are they're obviously picking up a lot of steam as a kind of company and operational structure. And I think it, o- over time that'll evolve and influence more and more businesses even beyond the world of crypto. So I think we're able to dive in a little bit as to how DAOs function, some of the pros and cons of those models. Um, as well as the future of NFTs and NFTs beyond just art, right? I think she had some really, um, uh, I mean, towards the end, we really speak with her about what she's most excited about with regards to the NFT landscape. And um, it, it goes far beyond just the the applications for, for crypto art and digital art. So really, really excited for this this episode with People Pleaser. Um, and and if you haven't already, definitely want to encourage you guys all to, to go subscribe to our weekly newsletter. We're kind of simplifying the NFT market and developments into actionable insights once a week. So to sign up for that, just go to nftnow.co. And without any further ado, People pleaser. People pleaser. So happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, why don't we kick things off? Just love to hear a bit about your background, how you got into art, DeFi, NFTs, um, the whole nine yards. Totally. So, I mean, I've been interested in art or, you know, into it, actually making art, drawing and everything ever since I can remember. Um, And then I studied design media arts in college, which sort of is a program that kind of just really dives very, very shallowly into all kinds of aspects of design, like typography, um, web design, like front end stuff. And um, and then so through that, actually, you know what, it's not totally related, but in college, I watched WALL-E for the first time. And then I was like, this is amazing. I want to do this as my career. And then so I like Googled how to get a job at Pixar and then um, went down this whole rabbit hole of learning 3D, basically. And then so then... I think around after like my third year of college, I felt like I was ready to sort of apply for jobs in the industry. And then so I ended up just going to work for a bunch of visual effects studios. Um, And I was just doing 3D ever since as like a profession, um, working on several movies in the industry and feature animations. And then um, uh, around this um, 2017, like uh, crypto bubble kind of, I, I mean, I had learned about Bitcoin and stuff in college, but, uh, you know, I didn't have money back then. Um, and then so in 2017, when I had made a little bit of money or have saved up a little money, I was like, how do I invest my money? And then so I was just lurking Reddit and stuff and then found the cryptocurrency subreddit and then learned about, you know, the whole culture and everything. And then so um, I just like threw a bunch of money and like a bunch of 2017 ICO coins, <laughs> which you I think was a rookie. You know, everybody makes this rookie mistake where you're like, Bitcoin and Ethereum are already so high, so I want to find the next gem or something, which at, at this point we all know is just not a thing. Um, so yeah, that's basically how I got crypt- into crypto, which it was um, separate from my sort of like career. And then where the two paths kind of like merged was last year um, in DeFi summer because uh, I had actually accepted a job offer at Apple, um, and then uh, 
the offer was then rescinded in March of last year because of COVID. Um, so then I was like, oh, I'm jobless now. What do I do, right? And um, this was the first time since basically working that I had n- not had a job or a plan. Um, and it was the pandemic. So I, I continued to sort of apply for a bunch of jobs, but uh, I got rejected from like every place mm-hmm. basically. And that whole summer while I was job hunting, um, I, I created my Instagram account, like my art account, um, just to sort of pass time while I was, you know, it was just a hobby. Like I was like, well, I've been working for so long, um, executing other people's visions. I might as well take this time to just do some creative stuff for myself. And then, um, and then around the same time, that was when DeFi summer happened. And then so one of my friends texted me and he goes, hey, dude, like I'm literally making probably five figures per day just farming coins right now. And then <laughs> I was like, what is this? Like, tell me more about it. And then so then I learned about DeFi. And then um, so then that's when I learned about crypto Twitter. So from 2017 to 2020, I actually only read about crypto through like subreddits and stuff. And then um, it was only... Um, last summer that I discovered crypto Twitter and while I was on there like lurking DeFi stuff just trying to make money and then I realized that there was a huge shortage of just creative talent you know around like promotional um, material and stuff and I was just like but there's like a huge meme culture right and I was like this totally is like vi- my vibe like <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I love memes and everything but I can do this I can make it better and then so um, my friend actually saw one of the crypto influencers with the name Blue Kirby. <laughs> and then he tweeted out saying, because at the time he was repping a uh, Wi-Fi urine finance, which would basically kickstarted um, DeFi summer. And then so he was like, oh, we're looking for talented video people to work with. Um, and so my friend sort of just like sent him my art Instagram and then Blue Kirby saw it, and he's like, dude, this is awesome. And then so he reached out to me and he's like, hey, are you interested in like working with us? And then, I mean, I was jobless at the time and stuff. So I was like, yes, I need money. <laughs> and then so I collaborated with them. And then, um, and then I don't know, that's literally how it started. Like, uh, because like then after I did another one with Pickle Finance and then that one graced Crypto Twitter and then everybody was just like, whoa, like what is this? Like who made this video? Um, and then so that's kind of like, and then people were like, oh, this is girl named People Pleaser. And I had created a Twitter account actually just for this reason. And then, um, yeah, just like one by one, my name got circulated in the DeFi space. And then so a bunch of other DeFi protocols would reach out and be like, can you make a video for us, like an animation and stuff? And then, I don't know, I had this like weird, like Japanese, like Mimi style, um, which I guess resonated really well with the community. And then um, to me as well, it was like a good way to learn about DeFi because like I can't make animations about these protocols if I don't know what's going on, right? Right. So I was like, you know, like (laughs) learning about it at the same time. So it's kind of like a win-win situation. And I was just like, I can make money. It's cool. And then, um, so then probably like 20 something videos later. Uh, well, so around this time, I also obviously discovered, discovered NFTs. So I don't know if you guys know, but like last summer, Kirby, Blue Kirby was like really, really big in NFTs. Like he dominated Rarible like all the time. Like this was like, I mean, obviously it was before NFTs blew up, but um, there was like Pranksy and then Blue Kirby was just constantly like either a number one or number two on Rarible all the time. Mm. Cause like he had such a big, um, sort of Wi-Fi, like DeFi fandom that um, he, and then he was collaborating with artists where anything like that they just release um, just sells out right away. Mm-hmm. And then so uh, through that, I learned about NFTs and I was like, what is this? And then it kind of blew my mind as well. I just like learned about like royalties and like, you know, like secondary sales, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, this is crazy. And then so I started minting like a few pieces myself, like on un- Rarible. And then um, they sold, but I mean, they were like really, really cheap at the time. And then I was just like, I was like mind blown. I was like, <laughs> who would want to buy my like JPEG? You know what I mean? I was, I just thought it was weird, but, um, I don't know if you guys know Matrix though. So he was actually one of my earliest collectors mm-hmm. where, um, I don't even know how he found me, but literally it, it would be like, I would release something rareable and he would snatch it up like right away. <laughs> and then, <laughs> well, it seems like now looking back, you know, he made like some good investments there. Um, yeah. And then anyway, so, but then I didn't really have that much time to dive into NFTs because I was actually so busy making animations for DeFi. And so 20 something videos later in March, I did the one for Uniswap. Um, and it was like a, an animation for their V3 launch, which was like basically the 
high, like the most highest anticipated announcement in all of DeFi, basically. And then so I knew it was going to be a big deal. And, um, you know, around when January, when like NFTs blew up and stuff, I knew that like that was something that I wanted to because I felt like um, the circles didn't really collide yet. Like there was like crypto Twitter and then there was like NFT art Twitter, but right. it was pretty like yeah, separate, yeah, yeah, you know? Sure. And then so I was like, how do I get my name into like NFT art Twitter, which I've been sort of neglecting because I've been so involved in crypto Twitter. And then so I, I brought up to the Uniswap team, I was like, is it cool if I also like drop this as an NFT? And they were like, yeah, sure, go for it. And then... <laughs> And, you know, I, I felt like um, for some reason, I, I felt like there's a possibility that it was going to sell for a lot um, just because of like my reputation at this point in the, the space and stuff. And because the people who've been following me are all people who got rich off of DeFi and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so I for some reason, I felt wrong, like taking that money or something, you know, and so, and it was something that I always wanted to do, which is um, do like an NFT, like sale for charity. But in my head, I was like, oh, I'll do that after I'm like a little bit more famous or something. You know, I didn't think it would be from like my first auction, but then I just thought that, you know, seemed like the right thing to do at the time. So why not? And then, so um, yeah, I don't know, like that week, Uniswap tweeted out the animation and like, it was a Monday, and then within 24 hours, it got like half a million views on Twitter. And then everybody's just like, is this video an NFT? And then so that Friday, um, I dropped it on Foundation. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know, like there was a bidding war. It was like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it ended up going for 310 Ethereum. And uh, Pleaser DAO was formed in that moment to buy it. Um, which I actually, so I tweeted this photo of me like <laughs> shedding a tear. And I tweeted it after the, the sale had closed. But actually, I took that photo when um, the sale hadn't closed yet. But it was the moment that I found out that um, people were coming together to form a DAO because somebody had actually told me about it and that they were, like, naming it after me and stuff. And I don't know, like, the sale hadn't even closed yet. I didn't know if it was going to sell to them or whatever. But it's just, like, the concept that people came together to form, like, a fan club DAO was just, like, so touching that I, I was like, oh. And then so I took a selfie. and then But I tweeted out after the sale. So people think I was crying because... Because, like, it sold for so expensive, but it was actually just because of the fact that my internet friends were so supportive. Um, and then after that, my life blew up, basically. <laughs> um, Please or doubt are now kind of like this, their own monster. <laughs> that, like, they're, like, doing all these, like, crazy things. And I'm just, like, happy on the sidelines watching. I mean, that was a really long story. <laughs> no, beautiful story. Good story. Sure yeah, yeah. 1,000%. Yeah. Um, I love the convergence of like crypto Twitter, NFT Twitter, and just kind of bringing together and uniting these different worlds. Um, definitely want to dive deeper into Please or DAO, but even uh, it'll take one step back. Can you just, for our listeners, describe what exactly a DAO is? Yeah, so DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and it's essentially um, like a flat, structured organization that uh, make decisions um, as a collective on uh, the blockchain and everything is um, transparent. You know, they pool funds, um, recruit members, everything is done on the internet through the blockchain. And um, I believe it is where the future of what company structures are headed towards. Um, that's the long and short of it, I think. <laughs> Awesome. And then as far I mean, you mentioned Pleaser DAO was kind of spontaneously created at that moment. Can you dive a little bit deeper into kind of just uh, what is the collective purpose and, and how does it function? Yeah. So right now, um, currently, Pleaser DAO are kind of more interested in collecting sort of what they call um, pieces of internet culture or pieces that have um, historical significance um, with yeah, within internet culture, so or uh, pieces that stand for like their ethos, which um, is somewhat inspired by my original sale. So you know they always kind of have like an, a chari charitable aspect um, towards their purchases. So you know the Edward Snowden piece, um, all of the proceeds of the five point five million went to freedom of the press, and uh, the Tor project piece, which went for two million. Um, goes to their nonprofit, which is protecting internet privacy. And um, uh, even part, I think partial of the Doge sale, uh, the Doge NFT um, also uh, went to charity as well. But, you know, also it is like the most OG meme ever. So obviously. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty dank meme. <laughs> yeah, sure. Blizzard now are like, we want this. Um, yeah, so there's several aspects to it, but I think 
their vision is to sort of create like the internet MoMA, you know, in the future of all these pieces that they think are historically significant and also have a charitable aspect towards them. And um, part of their vision as well is to, because um, this was the first time, so why this like specific event got so much attention in the space is because it's the first time that like a DAO had um, sort of formed to specifically purchase um, an NFT. And before this had happened, uh, I'm sure you guys are aware, but in the NFT space, it's pretty much just all a whale collector's game, right? Um, and individual collectors that were, you know, even when I was listing my thing for sale in my head, I had imagined, oh, I wonder which, you know, rich collector is going to come and take this piece home. And it it almost feels, I don't know, like, because at that point, I was more tapped into crypto Twitter than NFT Twitter. But, um, you know, with the whole concept of, like, DeFi and decentralized um finance is like uh, collectivism and, you know, about community. I'm sure, you know, NFT Twitter is as well. But um, at the time, you know, because the Uniswap video was going to be something that was going to sh- be shared with the whole community. And, you know, every, I, like I said, you know, it's like 500,000 views within the first 24 hours. That means all of crypto Twitter <laughs> has like basically seen it. So it almost feels wrong that that like piece would just belong to like one person because it does represent like so much of the community. And then so when the DAO was like forming while the auction was happening, I mean, just like blew my mind. I was like, this is not a concept that I had previously thought about of um, this collective ownership kind of thing. And then so, yeah, um, I think that was, a, and it's sort of the whole like ethos around that really represents what like Ethereum stands for as well. Um, and so I think that's why it got so much attention. And then they're sort of going to perpetuate this community or collectivism. And so, for example, something like the Doge meme, I'm sure everybody would love to have this NFT in their collection, right? But I don't know if he, any of us are willing to drop $4 million on like one NFT. So please or DAO's kind of idea is like, if we're please or DAO, we'll come and buy this and then we'll fractionalize it so that everybody can have a piece. And um, they're actually working with all of the major like NFT platforms and stuff right now to roll out a new function for when they launch this so that um, if you buy like fractional Doge, um, either it'll show up here in Rainbow Wallet or like um, Foundation or um, OpenSea or whatever, um, Showtime. And then so that's kind of like the idea right now. And then I think In the future, they're also interested in, like, incubating other artists and, like, you know, kickstarting, like, new projects. They're also uh, doing a lot of really cool stuff in DeFi um, because there's so many prominent, like, DeFi members. Uh, For example, they just did uh, the first, um, like, DAO to DAO loan. So uh, they literally collateralized, like, four of the pieces into the Iron Bank and then withdrew 3.5 3.5 million USDC. Um, so if you like, for example, go on Foundation or something and you go on the Pleaser DAO account, like all the pieces are gone. They're like not like owned by Pleaser DAO anymore because they're being held as collateral in the Iron Bank. And so there's a lot of like cool stuff going on. Um, that's the first time that's ever been done, at least at that scale. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Absolutely. No, it's this really helpful context. And it's really cool to see um, that democratization of access in terms of, you know, not having to be a whale to be able to, to, to play in this arena, right? Um, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about how, like, Please or Dow functions structurally, like deci- how decisions are made internally, and also just like what your role is there. I know you, you know, you're sort of like, it's got your namesake, like the spiritual side, but I know you also mentioned sort of being on the sidelines too. So just getting a sense for like what that looks like. Yeah, so... I mean, in the beginning, I I obviously didn't join until after my sale. I remember when the sale ended, they were like, oh, you should just grace our Telegram group just to make a celebrity appearance or something. So I literally joined the Telegram group for like two seconds. And uh, I was just like, oh, thanks, guys. And then I felt so weird, like it was too meta or something. So then I exited the Telegram group like right away. And then um, then I think a few weeks later, they uh, reached out again and they were like, hey, we sh- we really want you as like an honorary member or something. And then uh, that was when I learned a little bit more about like the vision and everything. And I mean, you know, a lot of people, these people are like my internet friends now and stuff too. And so, or people that I've like collaborated with previously in DeFi, right? Like founders of like DeFi protocols and stuff. So, um, you know, it's not like strangers or anything. Um, so I felt, and you know, so I finally kind of like understood like 
I remember um, this one guy, uh, Andrew Kang, he told me, he was like, please, your DAO is a movement. And then I was just like, I don't know what that means. But, uh, you know, I actually, my brain was so sort of like just not out there that I just thought that, oh, they would just purchase this piece and that was it, you know, and that was the end of sort of like the Pleaser DAO story. But yeah, I, I then sort of like had a click moment where I realized that, oh, it stands for more than that. And um, I thought it was really cool. So I joined them. And then, uh, so then since joining, like the first sale I got to witness was the Edward Snowden one, which was super cool. Like, honestly, during one of these auctions, like being in that Telegram group is just top quality entertainment. It's, well, it's both like, you know, super nerve wracking, but also like very exciting. Um, and yeah, like they kind of, you know, call me like the spiritual godmother or something of the Tao. Um, <laughs> hopefully I can still somewhat inspire, you know, positivity. And um, I think my personal brand, for example, uh, has a lot to do with just perpetuating um, positivity in crypto and also, yeah, like the charitable aspect of things. Um, and so I hope that, you know, that continues to sort of steer the Tao, but, you know, they have their own sort of like thoughts around things as well. And yeah, I guess um, both upside and downside is that my namesake <laughs> is attached to it. So, you know, <laughs> if they succeed, that's good for me. And if they fail, that's also not good for me. So I do think that, uh, compared to most of the members of the DAO, I have like a higher stake. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. When you think about DAOs, I know you mentioned um, that you feel like this will is kind of the future of how a lot of different sorts of businesses will operate. When you think about it infiltrating the broader business landscape beyond crypto, what do you feel like are some of the pros and cons of how DAOs operate as organizations? And like, what um, do you think it's going to take in order for like the more mainstream business market to adopt it? Um, so I think, you know, they're definitely like growing pains right now or that I'm experiencing and, you know, everybody in the DAO is, or in any DAO really is experiencing this because this is a new form or structure that's just like never been done before. So mm -hmm. everybody is learning on the fly, right? It's yeah. not like there's a handbook saying how to run yeah. a DAO <laughs> and then we're like, oh, this is how you do it. So everybody is just kind of free steering. Um, but I think what's, uh, so the pros, for example, is like, DAOs are basically the Silicon Valley wet dream or something where you can pull funds extremely fast. I mean, all of the funds that went to the Edward Stone piece, 2,224 Ethereum was pulled within, I think, 13 hours. Um, you know, they like literally got together and raised like 5.5 million from actually just like at the time um, internal members. Um, to purchase the piece. And, you know, in a regular world, just the bank transfers alone, like that's probably going to take weeks. You know what I mean? It's just like not possible. And you need to like get all this stuff signed off and everything. Um, so on top of pooling capital really quickly and efficiently, you can also recruit very quickly, right? Because everything's like done through, um, you know, the internet and stuff. And so uh, for example, the, all the funds in Pleaser DAO are being operated um, through a multi-sig. Um, and uh, on top of that, like there are certain cons as well. So DAOs are typically flat structured, but mm -hmm. that also means that, you know, it's harder to, and also because like in Pleaser DAO's example, everybody in Pleaser DAO is actually already somebody in like crypto or something. And then so everybody's really busy, you know, yeah. like people, everyone cares about the DAO and they want it to succeed, but they also have their own careers, including myself, right? Like I can't be dedicating a lot of time to running the DAO because right. we all need to do like our own stuff. And so um, I think that's sort of like the con is that because it's so flat structured, um, it's different from a company where somebody is just making the call and saying like, oh, yes or no to this. Um, it's basically more, at least how I feel, disorganized. Um, but Hopefully, I think that's just because it's so early and new right now that people haven't really figured out like a way to sort of like make things work. Um, I spoke with someone who's like making Orca protocol where I think they're developing like these things called pods for DAOs, which are I think like kind of like mini teams or like sub DAOs within DAOs to sort of become like a little bit more organized in the way that they like function. Um, so I'm excited to see um, something like that, like develop and hopefully be implemented within like a DAO structure. Because, for example, like Pleaser DAO probably needs that, you know. So, 
Very cool. You know, I love like the focus on philanthropy as well. You know, like obviously donating the proceeds from that first sale to, to stand with Asians. Um, the, you know, the fact that Please Your Dow has invested in these pieces that have a charitable aspect. I'm curious to hear your thoughts just looking at the intersection of like the NFT space and philanthropy. Like mm -hmm. if there are things you're seeing there that are interesting and if there's things that you'd like to see more of. Um, well, I mean, I was I was talking with a uh, Kit from Foundation, and while oh, you're having this conversation about, she was like, "Oh, dude, it's so great that you've inspired so many artists, you know, to take a um, philanthropic approach to their sales and everything." Um, but at the same time, I always say, like, as an artist, like, feed yourself first. Um, you know, it's not like that because you're donating it to charity that it's going to make your sale, you know, higher or something. Like, I think. Uh, taking care of yourself first is more important. Um, and then, you know, if you have leftover after, if you so please, yeah, I think uh, just me personally, I think it's just ridiculous, like how quickly people can make money in crypto during a bull run. And uh, there's so many people on this on this earth who just don't have access to those same resources, right? Because you need like internet and I don't know, I think you probably need to at least be um, you know, somewhat tapped into like internet culture and everything to have a certain sort of like privilege in life to be able to be engaging with cryptocurrency. And so um, it was just kind of a, a thought that, oh, um, to sort of distribute that like wealth a little bit. Um, that's like my take from it, I guess. And uh, but I mean, I've seen like, I don't know if you guys know James Jean. He's a very, very famous artist. Like it's, it was amazing. Um, he actually did a sale and then also donated um, part of the proceeds to the same fund that I created, which is now a community fund for the Stand With Asians um, like cause, I guess. And then, so they literally have a group of volunteers and then so they come together and then uh, they take applications from a bunch of like different charities and then they'll like go through it, see which ones like need it more and stuff. And then like, for example, for my sale, we rolled out 25,000. Um, so like 24 grants of $25,000. So we gave like 25K to 24 different charities, which is like great. Um, and then James Jean, like when he did his sale, um, donated to the same fund. And then so, and then recently the art director um, of Overwatch at Blizzard, um, Arnold Tang, who also did a sale on Foundation, also donated to the same fund. So it's like it's like becoming its own sort of like fund that's uh, perpetuating now, and hopefully people, more people, will be inspired to donate to a similar cause. I mean, it doesn't have to be that; it can literally be anything if people are interested. But also, you know, feed yourself first. <laughs> Precisely. When you think about the um, future of like. Um, NFTs, what kind of excites you most about the, the space and the application and of the tech? Uh, well, I mean, I, actually, I was just talking about this, but I, I find it really interesting that right now NFT is so focused on art and visual art. Um, because first of all, art can take many forms, right? Not just you know, this visual art that we see um, in the NFT space, like, you know, a book could be art, like music obviously is art. And uh, I think, you know, obviously NFTs right now, I think people almost um, think of it synonymously to art or, or visual art specifically. But uh, it really is sort of just the technology that enables kind of like this digital like signature or ownership. And so, you know, it can, I'm excited to see these things um, be applied to more sort of like uh, real world aspect things like concert tickets. You know, I mean, this obviously um, a lot of people talk about this already. Like, yeah, so like concert tickets or maybe even like owning a car or something, you know. Um, and I think that it's kind of weird right now that, for example, if you're like a musician um, and actually recently, I think some super famous like author from China who like wrote a really famous book was like reaching out and be like, oh, uh, I want to drop an NFT, but I need like a visual artist to like work with, you know, and um, and then so I was just thinking, you don't need to work. You know what right. I mean? And musicians are doing the same. They're like, I want to drop an NFT, but I need like a visual artist to help me or something. And I'm just like, I feel like that's how we know we're still early because, um, you know, it's the same thing as sure if you go to a bookstore, like, yeah, the cover art might help sell the book, but most of the time, I mean, you're not going to call the book like a painting, you know, let's say the book cover is a painting. You're not going to call that a painting or something. Just mm -hmm. like it, it's a book. Right. And then so I think with NFTs, it's the same. It's just like 
um, went from the real world to the digital world. And right now, people are still kind of thinking of it as like, oh, I need like a visual representation of it. You know, even if it's like somebody's trying to NFT a song, they shouldn't need to like, ha- it shouldn't be a requirement that they, they need to drop the NFT with also like a cool visual that like loops or something. Right. Um, so that's where I see like it going. Obviously, because like, I worked at Blizzard previously as well. So I'm super big on like um, NFTs and gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the most obvious one, I think. Like, uh, you know, sort of in-game uh, purchases and um, all these things have already existed. Like these economies have existed like way before NFTs. And it's literally the same thing, right? But it's just maybe with NFTs. Um, instead of, you know, if you buy like Blizzard currency, you can only use it in like Blizzard games. But Hopefully with NFTs, like, you can transfer these assets, like, cross games and stuff. Like, that'd be really cool. Or just, like, in the metaverse in general. Um, so, yeah, that's where I see it going. Yeah, that, that composability factor is, is really key. I always think about those those level 99 necromancers <laughs> from Diablo 2, if I could just trade those on the open market. You know? Yeah, and you should be able to, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the gaming space is really interesting. I'm also interested in, you know, given your background with, with DeFi and, and how that was kind of a, a, cr- a critical part of, of your rise. I'm curious uh, your thoughts on the intersection of NFTs and DeFi, because, I, you know, there are like, obviously there, there was meme and there's, there's others that have, that have started now, too, that are combining the two technologies. So I'm, I'm interested w- uh, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, hopefully, uh, Pleaser DAO can be sort of one of the front runners of this as well, because there's just like a, a crossover of people who are so passionate about NFTs and DeFi, like within the DAO that, you know, and originally they were talking about um, not just like fractionalizations of pieces, but, you know, one of the biggest themes in DeFi is like staking to farm like tokens and stuff. So uh, their idea is like maybe you can stake art um, and farm tokens or the other way around, like stake Ethereum and then you can farm fractional art um, in return or something. So I'm super excited to see that sort of come into more fruition um, within like crossing over between like DeFi and NFTs. And on the same topic, I think, yeah, it's a shame that there's such a separation between the two worlds right now because all these artists who are now earning Ethereum through their NFT sales should learn more about DeFi because you can literally like earn interest on your crypto. You know, like you don't have to just like let your ETH sit in your wallet. Mm -hmm. Um, There's, you know, very, very low effort pools. I mean, obviously there is some degree of risk, but you know, if you're comfortable with it, you should throw your ETH in there and just farm interest and then, you know, make your money work for you. I think uh, that would be amazing for like more artists to learn about and like adapt into their lifestyle as they're being onboarded into crypto in general. So, yeah hope to see more of that <laughs> absolutely that's amazing well um i think i guess as we come to a closing note i would really love to get a better handle of what are some of the projects you got in the works right now what, what, <laughs> what's kind of exciting you of what you can share give the nft now fans what they want um yeah so uh i think it's a funny thing where people are always like oh when like when are you dropping your next nft or whatever but i don't know if people have been following me they probably notice that i don't just sell nft um, you know, there's nothing wrong with like that being a thing. That also used to be my goal too. I'd be like, I want to become famous so I could just sell my NFTs uh, for a living. But um, nowadays I felt uh, sort of this <laughs> because I'm standing at this like intersection of DAOs, NFTs, and DeFi kind of. So, and I don't want to take this attention for granted. Um, it is a unique position to be in. And so I feel also a degree like of responsibility to uh, sort of help evangelize and spread these um, messages in a positive way. And so I'm only interested right now in collaborating with uh, NFT related projects that um, either help, you know, spread awareness of crypto to the mainstream. So for example, I just wrapped up the um, Ethereum documentary. I don't know if Mm. you guys saw that, but they're making an Ethereum documentary. And then we did a crowdfund um, using NFTs that I made. And then so we raised, within 48 hours, we raised um, over a thousand ETH. Um, And so that basically like funded (laughs) the project. And so they can now make the documentary, which I think is super cool. And, um, you know, obviously I think that will help, you know, hopefully when the documentary is made, it'll help um, sort of spread uh, awareness to crypto in a more positive way to the more mainstream world. And currently, um, right now, which I'm very, very close to finishing, we just um, sent out the still version uh, t- 
yesterday, which is the next cover of Fortune magazine. And so I'm doing the artwork for that. And then um, we're also going to be dropping it um, as an NFT. And um, most of the proceeds will go towards charity. But um, it, I'm, I'm excited because uh, this specific issue of Fortune magazine is a special issue that's talking about cryptocurrency and DeFi. And um, they'll also obviously talk about NFTs as well. So um, yeah, I think it's really cool that I got to do the cover for that and um, that it's going to be Fortune's first um, NFT like ever. So uh, if you think about it, it would be like, the, you know, when they came out in like um, 1920s, uh, their first sort of like physical cover, like this would be their first like digital cover, right? And so, I mean, it's going to be physical as well, but um, it'll be their first NFT. So hopefully, you know, in the future, like way into the future, I mean, like maybe somebody will be like, oh yeah, back in like a hundred years ago in like 2021, like Fortune dropped their first like um, digital covers. And yeah, so um, I'm excited about that. And also because their issue is covering cryptocurrency, I think it'll help, you know, spread the message as well. And so, yeah, currently, I, I think I'm more interested in just engaging with, like, these projects um, that sort of ha carry that narrative. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think the space really needs that. You know, I think that, uh, you know, extending that welcoming hand, we're all so early here. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, and I think you're really uniquely positioned to do that, um, given sort of, like, your background and how you're, inter you, know, you know, positioned at the intersection of all these, like, really exciting and interesting sectors. So, um, really glad to have your perspective um, on the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been a pleasure. Great episode, man. Really enjoyed that conversation. What stood out to you? You know, it was really interesting hearing her perspective as an artist situated at sort of the intersection of all of these different areas that are really growth sectors uh, and some of the most exciting parts of, of the crypto ecosystem, DAOs, DeFi, NFTs. She's, she's, in, she's in all of them. And I, I think it was really cool to get her perspective on DAOs and how DAOs operate. Um, I think it was also really interesting to hear her thoughts about uh, philanthropy and, and kind of, you know, how important charity and, and giving back is in the space. I think that's super important. It's something I would like to see more of in the space. Um, and, and, you know, her actions have been really great um, examples there. And, you know, I, I also just really appreciated, um, you know, her thoughts on the intersection of these different worlds, you know, DeFi and NFTs, gaming and NFTs. Um, it, it's all moving forward. And, and I think she's really in an interesting place to, to and has a really unique perspective on it. Yeah, totally aligned. Well, um, as always, thank you all for tuning in. Really grateful for your continued support. Um, we'll be back next week. And until then, have a great week. Cheers. Cheers.